band. So, Australia. Pastor Daryl Elliott, who now is the, the leader of uh, the Australian Fellowship in Perth, West Australia, he told me that when he was a teenage boy, he, uh, he lived, he grew up in Geraldton, which is in West Australia. He went to visit uh, his mother, which was, or grandmother rather. His grandparents lived, I believe, in Katanning in the Wheat Belt below Perth. And uh, he was not a Christian. His grandmother painted, she painted paintings. And he said in the back room, he saw a painting that was Australia. If you know the shape uh, of Australia, it's kind of geographically about the same uh, size as the United States. But in Australia, he said the painting, there was fire coming out of West Australia. And he was not a Christian. He said, Grandma, what's that? What is that painting? And she said, she was a Christian. She said, that is what God is going to do. He will bring revival fire out of West Australia that is going to touch all of Australia. Now, this was years before we even had a church in Australia. But God was already at work, and I actually, through the years, heard a number of people, various Christians, various places, they told stories like this, God is going to bring fire in West Australia. So now, I want you to think about my parents now and you, where I'm going to get up to their involvement in Australia. So my parents got saved through his oldest brother and wife, George and Ione Mitchell. They're living in Mitchell, Arkansas. It was a population like 200 people. George and Ione were Christians. They were not foursquare then through circumstances. They moved to Phoenix, Arizona. In Phoenix, Arizona, now they are looking for a church and I don't know the circumstances, but out of all of the churches, they chose and wound up choosing a four-square church. They were not four-square in Arkansas, but they choose and start attending a four-square church. So my father, as I've been telling you, was saved in First Phoenix four-square uh, church. A man named Fred Cowan. Fred Cowan was saved in... Uh, this same church, First Phoenix Foursquare Church, and he married a girl who was, uh, her parents were in the church. She was attending, was a Christian. Her name was Laverne. We have a picture of a young Fred and Laverne uh, Cowan here. And then let me show you a picture of the First uh, Phoenix Foursquare Church. This is the church in that building. That's where my parents were saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. So Fred Cowan got saved in that church before my parents were saved. Fred went to Bible school, went into the ministry. He was working as an evangelist out of that church when my parents got saved. My parents knew Fred and Laverne Cowan. They became friends. And uh, then when uh, mom and dad went in the ministry, Fred actually preached a revival. We have a, a picture of a revival. This is Eugene, Oregon. And uh, a water baptism. This is an old picture. Fred Cowan was preaching for my dad in Eugene, Oregon. And the note here uh, says that this woman was healed of cancer in the meeting. And they uh, uh, baptized her in the, uh, during that meeting. And so in 1963, Fred and Laverne became the pastor of the Foursquare Gospel Church in Prescott, Arizona. And they were here from 63 to uh, 1967. Got a, a picture, a couple of pictures here. There they are. And uh, I can't remember, that may even be in front of the church there. 915 Audrey Lane, that was the church parsonage. We lived in that house when we came in 1970. That's Laverne and the kids that were there. So he was pastoring here uh, from 63 in 19, uh, till 67. In 1967, Fred Cowan had a vision or a dream. And in his dream, he saw a field of wheat like it was waving in the wind and the 
field of wheat came together in the shape of Australia. So the wheat became Australia, and then in his vision, he saw a little spark of fire in West Australia, and that fire spread and consumed the entire nation of Australia. Now that is very powerful. On the basis of that vision, Fred felt that God was calling him to Australia, applied to the denomination Foursquare to be missionaries, and this is what they did in 1967. They left Prescott and went to Perth, West Australia. We have a picture here. This is them leaving in the next photo. Or no, actually, this is Fred here. That's uh, Ike Cook and uh, Debbie Cook. I, Fred was the pastor when Ike got saved, and he baptized Ike and De uh, Debbie Cook. Next picture is uh, here they are leaving for uh, Australia, and that was in 1967. He pastored a church in the suburb of Perth, an area called Vic Park, for one year. And uh, we have a picture here of uh, ministering. Some of these people in the photo, my wife and I knew these people. They became part of uh, our church, that, uh, uh, the, the Potter's House, in, in later years. And then in, uh, he came back to settle some business affairs, went back to Australia. He became the supervisor now. So now he is in charge of the churches in Australia, he became the supervisor in 1972, and he held that position for 14 years. Okay, so think about this. My uncle and aunt happened to choose a church that happened to be the church where Fred Cowan gets saved, right? Coincidence is not coincidence, is God involved. He feels called and has a vision of fire in West Australia, goes to West Australia, now he is in charge. So let's talk about the door of destiny. In 1977, Fred Cowan invited my father to come to Australia to preach. And you would have heard my dad's joke through the years. He was totally ignorant of Australia. And when he, uh, Fred asked him to come preach, he said, do they speak English? And my dad's joke for years was uh, after he got there, he found out kinda uh, they, they sort of speak uh, English. My parents in 1977 spent an entire month preaching around most of the churches in West Australia. We have some pictures here of their ministry. Uh, on the left, I th if I remember right, that's the church in Vic Park here. That's the city of Perth and the skyline for wherever they're staying. And then one more picture uh, iconic, this is the flower clock at King's Park and uh, overlooking. But this is their time when they're going just to preach. He was due to preach a revival in one of the main churches, one of the larger four square churches. Would have been very huge, probably a hundred something uh, uh, people. I think about 125 is what they ran. So he was to preach in the Morley four square church. Morley is a suburb of Perth, and my father, when he got there, saw that right about that time, the newspapers were filled with stories about UFOs. Every day they had stories about UFOs and people who claimed to be see UFOs and abducted by UFOs. And so dad, sensing a, an opportunity, he convinced the pastor, why don't you advertise a sermon about prophecy and UFOs? And he can, the man did it, he put an ad in the paper, and dad suggested a radical strategy for them. Why don't you have your people go on the streets to the shopping area and hand out flyers advertising? They didn't normally do that, but he convinced him. He said that God will use this in a church that normally ran about 125, 300 people showed up. And so numbers of people were saved, but this was foundational. My dad began to challenge the four square pastors. That is our call. Go outside the four walls. Do you see what happens when you go? 
You've been waiting for the sinners to come to you. Why don't you go to them? And God honored that in a number of people. So the pastors were stirred by the possibility of evangelism outside the four walls, which is absolutely foundational to us. Dad preached basically in almost every church in, in West Australia. And then he challenged uh, the pastors in a conference and he had three main areas that he was challenging the Foursquare pastors. Lesson number one was evangelism. He said, our call is to go outside the four walls. Mark 16, verse 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Okay, dad said, that's our call. If we're believers, every believer has that challenge in Mark 16, 15. And he began to challenge them, you need to go outside the four walls. That was a major lesson that, uh, uh, that dad began to preach and challenge them on. The second lesson was the power of open praise. Foursquare was a Pentecostal, or is I suppose still, a Pentecostal denomination, but dad saw that these churches tended to keep the Holy Spirit low key. The Holy Spirit is good, but they didn't want to embarrass anyone. They didn't want to offend anyone. So they tended to keep the Holy Spirit quiet and low key. So dad began to challenge them. That's not biblical. He said in church, we are called to praise openly. Here's a quote that my father uh, used to say, praise is essential to what we're doing. Without praise in a service, you will not have the proper atmosphere for the moving of the Holy Spirit. This is based on Psalm 22, verse 3, just one of the verses. But thou art holy, O thou inhabitest the praises of Israel. Okay, I don't usually quote the King James, but I like this. That inhabits, you dwell in, you live in. So in other words, Dad said, Biblically, when God's people begin to praise, God shows up. And isn't that what we want in church? You don't just want the pastor to flap his lips. We want God to show up. And so he began to challenge them. He would preach on praise. And then he would say, let's praise God. And he got them to praise loudly, openly, because he felt that was foundational to who we are uh, of course we feel that's who we are but he was saying listen if you're a believer if you're a Pentecostal we need to praise openly the third lesson that dad challenged everywhere he went in the conference was the importance of giving dad saw that uh, uh, a spirit of poverty had taken hold in the uh, of the churches there they were uh, barely scraping by most of the churches. Some of them had theologies of why this was more spiritual. But dad boldly preached on money. Every church he went to, and then in conference, he would preach on money. And in the conference, after preaching on money, he took an offering at the end. I'm, I'm assuming they had an offering uh, as they would regularly. But he preached on money and boldly challenged them to give. They said more money came in in one offering than had ever been given in an entire conference because dad challenged uh, uh, him. First Kings 17, verse 13. Then Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said and make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me and afterward make some for yourself and your son. Okay, so dad felt the job of a man of God is to challenge people to give. Many pastors, it's almost like they're embarrassed to, to preach on money. They're embarrassed to take off. Not dad. So absolutely not. He boldly, like Elijah did. Listen, give to the Lord first. That's the key to God helping you. And, and so dad gave this challenge. In, in Australia at that time, uh, they didn't have uh, offering plates or, or, or bus. Uh, uh, baskets, uh, what they had was offering bags. These were sticks with kind of a, a round to clamp contraction and it had a, you know, some kind of velvet or leather bag. I don't know what it was. But Dad saw, knowing human nature, because no one could see, he 
he had experienced this before. Some people like to make other people think they're giving. And when you have this bag that no one can see, people can put their hand in, everybody go, oh, he's giving. They're actually not putting anything in. So he said, you know what? If you want your offering to go up, he said, get rid of those bags from hell. Get rid of them and get offering plates. And when they got offering plates, their offerings went up. And that was dead. He said, listen, giving is a part of being a Christian. If you're embarrassed about giving, if you're embarrassed about taking offerings, God is not going to honor that. And so this was the challenge. So my dad spent a month, think about that, one entire month he preached for almost 30 days in almost every uh, uh, church, a four-square church there. While he was there, he saw the potential of Australia. And what he often said, you know, this is now 1977. We began in Prescott in 1970 in the Jesus movement. Dad said it feels like it's 10 years behind America. He felt there was an openness and said there is incredible potential here. And he wanted Australia to be reached. He understood from our experience in Prescott that music could be uh, used as an outreach tool. And so he offered to Fred Cowan, he said, I will send the band Eden to come and play concerts in Australia. Fred Cowan, God bless him, he arranged this, agreed to that. Eden, who by now the four members, they were all pastoring by this time. Eden came for a month of outreaches. They, they went there, if I remember right, Ron Burrell said they did 28 concerts in 30 days, playing everywhere. They played in schools, in parks, in churches. In one concert in, in a, a, a park in um, downtown Perth, uh, apparently uh, I hear such numbers as 3,000 people came out to a concert uh, that they did. Hundreds of people were saved. And so now dad began to see what God was doing in our church and in the churches that we were planting. He began to understand the same approach that we use here, the same approach we started using in Mexico. He said, this will work in Australia. And uh, off the back of that concert in 1977, in 1978, uh, Fred Cowan invited Ron Burrell, who was pastoring in Flagstaff at the time. He was one of the members of Eden who was playing there. He said, why don't you come back in 1978, come back and preach at our camp. The Foursquare had a camp. They were big on the camp thing. And then also in numbers of our churches, and this is what happened. Ron went and preached. And while he was in, um, uh, in Australia preaching around, God spoke to him and called him to Australia. So this is something that is a, 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 an incredible thing. But catch this. This all came because God arranged it. God put places in it. He's way ahead of us. We pray, yes, but actually what we do is we pray to release the things that he is already working on. Think about that. People, God is stirring them. Fire is going to come from West Australia. Fred Cowan had that vision. God bless him. Here, let's move on. Let's talk about launching international churches. Up until 1978, our only international churches outside the U.S., they were in Mexico. And our churches in Mexico, remember when I talked about that, how did they come about? By accident, right? It wasn't the grand plan, we're going to plant a church in Mexico. It was, we're sending them to Nogales, Arizona, bought a building, couldn't use it for six months. Let's go across the border and see what God does. And so God began to bless. So while Ron Burrow was preaching in Australia, he felt called, came back and told my father, Pastor Wayman Mitchell, I feel God wants me to go pioneer in Perth, West Australia. And so in July of 1978, for the first time ever, 
we announced a couple deliberately, not by accident, deliberately we are sending them to another nation. Now, some of you have been to conference after, that, that's the Thursday night thing. You gotta understand, it had never been done before. This was, we're sending them to another nation on the other side of the world. And when it was announced, understanding it was gonna cost more money, Pastor Mitchell raised money to send them to uh, another nation. That was absolutely revolutionary. So now this became a part. So what happened is you had all churches uh, at that time, uh, I don't remember the, the number off the top of my head in 78, we may have had uh, 40 churches around that, 35 or 40 churches of varying size, but all of these churches pooled resources together for a common cause in the nations to launch somebody in, a, in another country. And that is a profound uh, principle in the Bible. Philippians 4, 15 through 17. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Okay, so now Paul was uh, uh, in uh, the church in, in Thessalonica, and he wanted to pioneer in another nation. So now he is talking that there were people that saw a vision. They didn't live in the other nation. Maybe some of them would never go. Maybe they didn't know anybody in another nation, but they understood God wants us from where we are to reach another nation. I can't go. I may not be called to go, but I can participate. I can give. And he says, you partnered with me for uh, reaching another nation. And so once we did that the first time in July of 1978, this now, remember what I'm saying in our fellowship, the vision unfolded, the steps of a righteous man. He didn't get this grand plan. It was like the next thing. And now this became a part of what we could do. The vision opened up. If that worked in launching a couple to Australia, then that means we could do that in any nation. We could do this anywhere in the world. And you saw that just at our conference a few weeks ago. That is now a part of our vision in our fellowship is launching to the nation. So in 1978, Ron and Susie Burrow went. Uh, that's when they were uh, announced, wound up going, I think a month or so later, October of 1978, is the boroughs wound up pioneering in Perth, West Australia. They located in an area uh, called Victoria Park and, uh, and Teddington Street was the building and the church began to grow. So what we discovered here, many of the patterns that had been established in our church in Prescott, he used them there. Went there and he established the concert uh, uh, ministry, started doing outreaches on the street just like he would do in Prescott, began challenging the people to openly praise, began challenging them to give. Uh, one of the brothers in the church said he remembers being in the church at the eight-month mark of the church. Ron preached on money and took a pledge. Eight months after the church opening, they went self-supporting. We got a picture here, uh, some pictures. This is actually the original brochure that he used. The Potter's House was coined by Ron Burrell in Perth, West Australia. That's why when people say, oh, Potter's House, you're T.D. Jakes. No, T.D. Jakes, that was back in the 90s. He became the Potter's House. 1978 was the first time we ever used that name, coined by Ron Burrell. Here was, that's one part of the brochure. Next one, I think, is the brochure. And you have here, here's Ron Burrow there. He has a picture of my dad explaining. And uh, when he first went there, some of these other 
uh, people here, the guy with the funny hat there and different ones. Uh, he actually had partnered with some people. They had kind of a, a ministry, sort of a rehab flop house kind of thing, but he partnered in initially just to find his way. That was the original, that is from October of 1978. And then uh, the next photo here, we have some, uh, these are uh, converts from when Ron Burrow was there on the left. Here is Russell and Sue Plummer. Uh, that photo's a little later, but Russell and Sue came in the church. God touched them. They are still in the church today. Uh, great blessing. Mike and Maria White were converts. They got saved when the Burrows were there. Mike and Maria became pastors. They have been missionaries. They now pastor the church that I pioneered in Launceston. Tasmania, and so that is the original fruit. Any of you, if you were here in 1978, that scripture we read in Philippians, fruit that abounds to your account, those people and anybody that they have ever reached, God says he has recorded it to your account because that's what God does. So here is the lesson, finally, before we move on, is playing your part in God's, God's plans. Let's go back. Next photo here, I want you to see here, Fred and Laverne Cowan, think about this. If you keep your heart right, if you listen for God's voice and you obey, you never know what you will release. Think about this. Fred Cowan is in Prescott, Arizona, has a vision of Australia. Fred was in touch with the Holy Spirit. He felt that was God calling him. Now, I'm sure that Fred thought that vision of the fire was he was the one who was going to bring the fire. In God's plans, that's not exactly how it worked out, but God bless Fred. Fred opened the door to Australia. I, I want to tell you, I owe Fred a great debt because I have an Aussie wife from Perth, West Australia, that church that Fred opened the door. God bless him. But... My Aussie wife is not actually the biggest. To me, it's the most important. But <laughs> think about, and I'll, I'm going to talk about Australia more later on, from the Australian churches, from that first church in Perth, West Australia. Remember the vision? Daryl's grandma, fire from West Australia is going to spread. Fred Cowan, fire in West Australia. From that church in Perth, West Australia, Right now, the Australian Fellowship, they have 352 churches in 31 nations. That is God. Praise God. If you play your part, Fred and Laverne Cowan, they played their part, and I am honoring their part in the work that is ongoing in Australia. God bless you. Fred and Laverne, if you can see from heaven, we thank you. And I am grateful for you. Let's look at one final lesson for today in our history. I want to talk about the Foursquare Convention of 1978. Okay, Dad was a Foursquare pastor. 1970, he takes over the Foursquare Gospel Church in Prescott, Arizona. I have described to you how revival broke out in the Jesus movement. Hippies were getting saved. People are getting powerfully converted. And then dad gets the vision of discipleship, training workers in-house, and he began to send these workers who had never gone to Bible school. Couples were sent from our congregation, and they began to grow. So they, they dubbed us, Foursquare dubbed us the Arizona Fellowship because we originally were planting our churches in Arizona. What they were recognizing is we were different than the usual uh, uh, Foursquare mold. And so Foursquare had done an article on us. They had a magazine, it'd be like the equivalent of our trumpet magazine, it's called Advance. They did an article on what God was doing because it was hard to ignore. Let me see if we have the photo of the Advance magazine. This is actually in there. These photos are from Prescott in the concert outreach. There's the church at the top, Jack Conley in the bottom, dad witnessing on the plaza. 
some different photos. And in that article, it was telling this incredible story of the Spirit of God moving in the Foursquare Gospel Church in Prescott, how these hippies were getting saved, getting a passion for God's will, and they were being raised up. So what typically happened in Foursquare is whoever has something going, they were often invited to speak at their, they called them convention, it'd be our equivalent of conference. And so they said, Wayman, why don't you come? We'll let you speak in one of the morning slots. But they also said, why don't you bring some of those young converts that you have now launched out into uh, uh, the uh, harvest field? And so the idea was that at a conference, he brought Harold Warner, Ernie Lister, and Jack Harris, and they came and gave a short testimony of what God had done in their lives and now they were pastoring they were proof that discipleship uh, uh, works and so we have some photos let me see the next photo is what they oh no no go back back don't show those yet so dad is invited to come this was on the one hand it's an honor that they asked him to come but dad was in turmoil and the reason why he was in, in turmoil he was already getting backlash. He was getting snide comments and attacks from people because dad spoke what he believed. That was dad. He didn't back off. And I, I can't remember if I mentioned this uh, last week or week before. They invited him to speak at Life Bible College. And what did he talk about? That Bible colleges are not of God. <laughs> That's not exactly how to win friends and influence people, but nonetheless, Dad, he spoke the truth. So Foursquare, I want mean, to catch this. The Foursquare Gospel Church was founded by Amy Semple McPherson. She was a woman preacher. We talked about that last week. But Amy Semple McPherson was a fireball. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, the Hessenauers, Don Hessenauer, uh, you know, this is a, a lady. She was Canadian. This lady, uh, she had an Oldsmobile car, the back seat, came down and became a preaching platform. Everywhere she drove th through, Amy Semple McPherson would stand up on the back seat of her car and she would preach. So God bless her. That was, that was the spirit of Foursquare was evangelism. But what dad saw is over the years now, they drifted. This is the danger for any organization is they start to move away from the very things that made you powerful. So instead of open air evangelism, gospel outside, remember I've told you again and again in different ways, what they said is if you'll have kiddie programs, then, you can, then the people will come to the church and get saved. So now dad in the lead up to the convention, he was in turmoil because he's in Foursquare, but he felt they were drifting. Should I just preach a nice sermon so everybody will clap, or should I challenge them and call them out that we're drifting from what we used to be? It's very interesting. I have the, probably the, the greatest treasure I got from my dad when he died is his old Bibles. And the reason why is that it, it's, you can see in the timeline of his life, whatever he was going through, God would speak to him from God's word. I have some uh, pictures from dad's Bible. And here, uh, I want you to look at this. This is uh, Isaiah. I can't remember what, what verse this is. Gird up your loins, arise, and speak to all that I command you. Be not dismayed at their faces. And his note down there, God spoke this to him. The conference convention was going to be in February regarding the international convention and the message that was to be given. But, but he, the reason why is dad was wrestling with this. He, he uh, was battling it himself. Next uh, verse here. And who are you that you should be afraid of a man that shall die like the son of man? 
I shall be made like grass. God spoke that January 28 of 1978, and the note on the right says regarding the convention that was going to take place on February 29th in 1978. One more verse that we have here, and uh, I think it's verse 12. Uh, I uh, am he that comforts you. That who are you that you should be afraid of a man that shall die? And so he. This is what God began to speak, and so Dad made up his mind, I'm going to preach and I'm going to say what God tells me and that is exactly what he did. He was going to passionately call Foursquare back to their roots. He wasn't asking them to change everything, just simply get back to what you used to be. Okay, so that's what he made up his mind. I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to preach God's word. So now he comes to convention. The men spoke. He had a morning slot. Apparently the, uh, the guy went long and kind of ate up uh, his time, whether that was by design or whether the guy was full of wind, I don't know. But uh, in the convention, one of the major players in Foursquare was a man named Roy Hicks Sr. He was one of the leaders, one of the uh, big names in Foursquare. Roy Hicks Sr. preached in the conference and made the comment Converts should not witness until they had undergone a training course. <laughs> and so Dad said, no, no, he's not going to put up with that. When Dad got up to preach, he actually called him out by name. And he said, Roy said that converts should not witness. He said, you're wrong. And he biblically said, why? And began to tell of when people open their mouth from the moment you get saved, you have the Spirit of God at work in you. Also, another star of Foursquare was Jack Hayford. Jack Hayford, his church was growing rapidly in, in uh, California. Jack Hayford had a doctrine. He wound up writing a book. I don't know if the book was written at that time. But he began to talk about something he called overflow the overflow doctrine. And what Jack Hayford said is our call as believers, our only call is to worship. That's the only thing we're supposed to do is we worship. If we will just come together and worship, 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 we create this atmosphere. Remember what we believe, worship creates the atmosphere so God touches you here. Jack Hayford said no. Worship creates an atmosphere and it, it's, like, it's like a glass getting full, 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 full. And, and then it overflows and the Holy Spirit oozes out the door and down on Highway 89. And, you know, that, that, that's literally what he was preaching. Our only call is to worship. And so, Dad, he went after it. And we have this. You can, please don't listen to it now, but on our website, you, uh, Stephen has put this up so you can actually listen to dad's sermon. He passionately is preaching about evangelism. Some of you have heard clips from that through the years. But what he was doing is he was calling them back to their roots, which is evangelism. And I want to tell you that was extremely polarizing. That caused division. Remember, I've been leading you down in the, uh, the timeline in the story. We were four square. Why are we not four square? I told you in step one, as uh, dad began to uh, uh, preach that Bible school was not the answer, began to train workers and not go to Bible school, that's strike one. That's strike in the very heart of denominational control. Number two, when he sent them out, and they began to succeed. If all of our men had struggled or died, that would have been okay. But they didn't. Tucson was growing. Flagstaff was growing. And so this is, this is upsetting people. Thirdly, I told you that it had to do with territorial tensions. When we planted men in areas where Foursquare supervisors were controlling, they were very upset. How dare you? plant these untrained men, and then more, how dare you, how dare they grow? How dare they succeed? So the tension then 
Then the next nail in the coffin was when dad said, female pastors are unbiblical. He said, male leadership, that is the Bible pattern. Now the targets were out. And then in the 78 convention, when dad called them out and preached, now it was, the lines were being drawn. They're not gonna put up with this. They're not gonna tolerate this. The end is going to uh, come. And so what you began to see from that time is the opposition began to solidify. Foursquare pastors, foursquare leaders began to work against, speak against, began to uh, uh, target that. And so it was only a matter of time. So there, 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 it's impossible because now what dad was doing was gonna be so different from Foursquare, he actually is now threatening their foundations of female leadership, denominational control, uh, Bible schools, all these kinds of things. And so there were people that began to say, we cannot have this. They began to work. And so this was, a, it didn't, it was not completed until 1984, but nonetheless, 78, this, uh, this was iconic. Very interesting. We received a letter. Uh, I'm trying to think in my memory. It would have been at least 10 years ago. It might have been 12 or more years ago. It was an anonymous letter. It arrived in the mail. This letter was apparently written by a Foursquare pastor. And he was there in that sermon. And he describes, it's very, it's very, very interesting, he is, he is talking about how bold dad uh, went after. He, he, and he's describing from his perspective, I have no idea who it is, he wouldn't put his name on it, but he's, he's talking about how they had become so effeminate and, uh, you know, just wishy-washy. And he talked about now Foursquare, one of their conventions, had invited a Catholic nun on the stage and one of the leaders said, isn't this wonderful? But he said, Pastor Mitchell went after it. And he said, that did not go well. And he talked about these young guys that he brought with him and said, they, they, after the sermon, he said, they stood next to dad as if daring anybody to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Probably wouldn't have gone well if anybody did, but, but he, said, uh, he said that he had talked to a, uh, uh, a Foursquare leader who admitted, said, seeing that these young guys who were planted out without going to Bible school and succeeded, they said, this, this, he said, in a rare moment of honesty, the man said, that was very humbling because everything we take pride in, they're doing different and God is blessing, but he recognized, he said, Dad threw down the gauntlet. And what he was really doing is simply calling them back, and that's, I'm not surprised at all that Dad did that, because even though he wrestled with it in the beginning, his dad believed our call is to stand for what is right. And so that is what he did, but that was a major part of then the, the division that would come finally be completed in 1984. And so now we see, I'm, I'm, I'm praying that you see all through this, this is why dad would say, this is a work of God, it's not of man. It wasn't something that he dreamed up. God moving on people supernaturally, giving them dreams, they happen to be in the church where dad would get saved, to invite, to make connection. In every stage, Dad recognized, that's why he would say, this is a work of God. He didn't dream this up. God was way ahead. God wanted us to make worldwide impact. And when we began launching the first church into Australia, that absolutely opened up our world. And from that time, that is a powerful part. Every uh, conference, as if they're of any size at all, is that this is how we structure, is to be able to plant churches to the nations. And that is why now I think we are uh, in uh, more than 140 nations of the world now. That simply came, and it started right here in Prescott, 1978, the pattern that God was unfolding. 
to us. Praise God. We're going to stop there, and the service will start this morning at 1030. God bless you.